In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, my dear faithful, we will continue with our series of talks on the Catholic faith, considering the creation. Article 1. God is the creator of the universe. This we find in the Apost Apostolic Creed, when we profess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. This article excludes the doctrine, false doctrine, known as pantheism, which is the teaching that God and the universe are one. Pan, theos, everything, God. Everything is God. This is false and is a teaching typical of that intellectual and moral system known as gnosis, which is the perennial rival of the Catholic faith. To this we shall return later. God created the world from nothing, ex nihilo. Not from nothing as from some pre-existent matter, but from nothing in the sense that there was no pre-existent matter in the sense that nothing existed before the world, not even time. Article 2. God is the creator of the universe, first of the angels and of matter, and later of mankind, Fourth Lateran Council. The dogma expressed by this council corresponds to the account of creation in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, we read, where the heavens are understood as the angelic creation and the earth understood as matter, and where man was created later. On the scale of being, God, is of course the highest, purely spiritual and infinite. After God come the angels on the scale of being, partly spir purely spiritual but finite. Then man himself, part spiritual and part material, and as such known as known as the microcosm, the small universe, containing as he does both principles of created being, spirit and matter. There's something of the whole creation in man. After man, on the scale, come the animals, purely material, but sentient, with senses, and living. After them, the plants, purely material, not sentient, but living. And lastly, inanimate matter, such as the four elements. Article 3. The final end of the creation is the glory of God. First Vatican Council. The question of the reason for creation the reason that there should be anything created. Why something rather than nothing? Or more simply, why? Cura is perhaps the most fundamental question of all questions. The pre precise theological question here is why did God create the universe when he is himself the sum of all perfections in whom he finds his own perfect beatitude. As St. Augustine says, the end of his work, the Confessions, he is his own beatitude. He has no need for anything. He lacks nothing. There was nothing outside himself which could have made any demands on him, unlike us, 
on whom he himself and people make demands. Why then should he create anything at all? The only possible reason or ground for this can be God himself. The church accordingly declares that his reason for creation was to manifest his glory, to communicate his glory, to create something which should share and express his glory. As I said, this dogma is to be found in the First Vatican Council. Article 4. Some of the angels became evil and thereby were transformed into devils. The Fourth Lateran Council. God created and creates everything good. He created the angels good. He created man good. But a part of the angels fell and the first man fell. Why? Why did the angels fall? According to tradition, they refused to adore, they refused to serve God and preferred to adore themselves. A common patristic explanation is that they were presented an image of the incarnation before it occurred but refused to adore our Lord because of his human nature, a nature inferior to their own. So, in other words, my dear people, the angels were submitted to a, a trial, as indeed the first couple were submitted to a trial, a trial of their goodness, a trial to see if they were worthy of immediately being admitted, in the case of the angels, to the vision of God. And a part of the angels failed in this trial. And so they became evil and were transformed into devils. There is no return for the devils to the presence of God. The devils will never be forgiven. The devils will never see the face of God as he is in heaven. Their will has been transformed and perverted by themselves. They knew exactly what they were doing when they refused to adore God and that their, their, the consequence would be eternal. Article 4. Man is a unity of body and soul material body and spiritual soul, Council of Chalcedon. This unity is a unity in body and soul. They are one in body and soul, corpore et anima unus. This teaching corresponds to Aristotelian scholastic philosophy that man is one substance composed of body and soul, which is the living person, where the soul is the form of the body, in the sense that the soul is that which makes it a living person, the principle of its life and operations. Article 5. Each man has a guardian angel, ordinary and universal magisterium. St Thomas Aquinas argues that if a king were to send one of his subjects on a dangerous journey to another kingdom, he would have him accompanied by another subject as a powerful guide or guardian. And this is just what the guardian angel is for us on our perilous journey through life towards another kingdom, the kingdom of heavenly glory. Article 7. The most glorious of all rational creatures, of all men and angels, is the most blessed Virgin Mary. 
Encyclica Ineffabilis. Although she possesses a nature inferior to that of the angels, that is to say, the human nature, she surpasses in excellence all of the angels. Amongst all created things, she is second only to the most sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed Pius IX, in the bull Ineffabilis, writes, God honoured her above all other creatures with such love that in her alone he was pleased with a most singular benevolence. Therefore he wonderfully filled her, far more than all the angels and saints, with an abundance of all the heavenly gifts taken from the treasury of his divinity. In this way, she, being always and absolutely free from every stain of sin, com completely beautiful and perfect, would possess such a plenitude of innocence and sanctity that, under God, none greater could be known, and apart from God, no mind could ever succeed in comprehending. Article 8. She was preserved immune from the stain of original sin by the Immaculate Conception, Ineffabilis, being, in fact, the bull which defined dogmatically her Immaculate Conception. This dogma teaches that from the first instance of her conception, that is, from the first instant of her life, the most blessed Virgin Mary was preserved from the loss of grace. One consequence of original sin on the part of Adam and Eve was that the whole human race should be conceived without sanctifying grace. Our Blessed Lady was the exception, together, of course, with our Blessed Lord. This means, in effect, that our Blessed Mother was conceived in the grace of God. The other consequence of original sin from which she was immune in the teaching of tradition was concupiscence. That is to say, the disordered movements of fallen nature in other words, she was in complete control of all her passions and emotions and all the movements of the soul from the very beginning of her life. Article 9. She was immune from personal sin for the whole of her life. The Council of Trent. Her immunity both from original and personal sin was necessary in order that she should be worthy of being the mother of God. Her divine maternity is the ground for her whole dignity and all her sublime privileges. Article 10. She is ever virgin, before, during and after the birth of her divine son from the encyclical, encyclical cum quorum dam. A. She was virgin before the birth of Christ, as we profess in the Creed. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. The scriptural basis for this dogma we know well, my dear faithful, and it is found in the first chapter of St. Luke and St. Matthew. In the first chapter of St. Luke we read, the angel Gabriel was sent to a virgin and the virgin's name was Mary. We read similarly, her words, how should this be since I know not man? And then the archangel replies, the Holy Spirit will descend upon you, and so on. Similarly, in the first chapter of St. Matthew, 
we read of the accomplishment of the, this very prophecy in the following words. Before she and St. Joseph lived together, she was found to be expecting a child by the operation of the Holy Spirit. As to the virginity during the birth, this dogma refers to the bodily integrity of the Most Holy Virgin during the birth. The dogma is taught as early as the Synod of Milan under St. Ambrose in the year 390. Rejecting the error of a certain Jovinian that a virgin conceived, but a virgin did not give birth. The fathers and theologians use various analogies of this mystery. The procession of thought from the human mind, the passage of Christ through the sealed tomb and through closed doors, as also the passage of a ray of sun through glass. C. As to the virginity subsequent to the birth, apart from the council already mentioned, as well as others, it is expressed in the title Ai Parthenos, in the Council of Chalcedon, as also in the Roman rite, where we pray, Memoriam Venerantes Semper Virginis Mariae. Objections to this part of the dogma are typically Protestant in origin and derive from a misinterpretation of the Bible expressions brothers of Jesus and firstborn son. The word brothers in the first phrase is a translation of a Hebrew word more accurately to be translated as cousins. And the second expression, firstborn son, is a word used in Jewish culture of the first son, whether he had brothers or whether he was the only son. So, my dear people, a very little research suffices to show that this objection is entirely unfounded. Quite apart from the fact that those who bring it obviously have not realised that tradition is part, one of the sources of our faith, and not just the Holy Scriptures. Article 11. Being the mother, according to the flesh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is a divine person, she is truly the mother of God. Here again, we refer to the creed, as well as to the council of Ephesus. In the creed we profess, I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord, born of the Virgin Mary. In these words, we profess at the same time that our Lord Jesus Christ is God, that the most blessed Virgin Mary is his mother. The same dogma is taught in the Council of Ephesus, this time in negative terms, as follows. If anyone does not profess that the Emmanuel is God in truth, and for this reason the Holy Virgin is mother of God, anathema sit. I remind you, my dear friends, that anathema sit means he is excluded. This means that the person that would deny this dogma is excluded from the church. In other words, the denial of a dogma entails exclusion from the church Someone that denies a dogma becomes a heretic and ceases to be member of the church. This is a penalty which the church imposes to express the truth in a very clear form and to warn heretics of the danger of denying even one dogma of our faith. If they don't confess before their death, they will be condemned to hell. So the church, by assigning these
these terms to her declarations is inviting the heretics and the people who doubt the truths of our faith to reflect again and return to membership of the church so that they may have eternal life. The Council declares that our Blessed Lady is Mother of God according to the flesh. What does this mean? It declares that since she gave him all that other mothers gave, give their children, that is to say, their flesh, she is truly his mother. Since, in addition, he is a divine person, she thereby becomes mother of God. So by giving him his flesh, she is his mother. But in giving his flesh to a divine person, she becomes the mother of that divine person. In other words, the mother of God. Without this explanation, based on the Council of Ephesus, on the great, very great theologians who expressed this dogma in the Council of Ephesus, it would be hard to imagine how our Blessed Lady could be the Mother of God, because we might think to, my, to ourselves, well, God is eternal, indeed exists outside time. Our Lady came into existence after the beginning of the world, so how could she be the mother of someone who is eternal? Well, I, the answer I have given to you. Article 12. At the end of her earthly life, she was assumed a body and soul into the glory of heaven, munificentissimus Deus. The dogma of the assumption expressed in that, that encyclical, which was written and promulgated in the 1950s, being the last dogma till now declared by the Catholic Church in, from the mouth, indeed, of the great Pope Pius XII, is a doctrine not contained explicitly in the Holy Scriptures, but rather in the oral tradition. As I said before, and I will not tire of saying, our faith in divine revelation derives from two sources, not just from the Holy Scriptures, but also from the oral tradition. At the end of her earthly life, then, our most blessed mother passes out of life through a form of sleep or dormition, as it is often said in the Eastern Church. She is assumed into heaven, glorified both in body and soul, like our Lord after the resurrection. Her assumption differs from his ascension in that she is drawn into heaven, whereby we say assumption, whereas he rose of his own power. Therefore, we say ascension. Another interesting difference is pointed out by St. Alphonsus, and that is that in a certain sense, her assumption was more glorious than the ascension of our Lord, because our Lord himself according to the tradition of the church, came to, came to take him with, with himself into heaven. The, the assumption was of this type. The theological motives for the assumption are grounded in the intimate relationship between the most holy mother of God and her divine son. One. If he had to die and then rise into heaven, it was appropriate that she should too. Two, if she participated so intimately in his battle against Satan, it was appropriate that she should participate in his victory against Satan and death. Three, it was appropriate that the mother of the Redeemer should enjoy the full fruit of the redemption, 
that is, the glorification of body and soul immediately after death. Article 13. The whole human race descends from a single couple, Adam and Eve, the Council of Trent, implicitly. This doctrine, as equally the doctrine of original sin, which we shall address in a moment, has been taught by the Church at all times and in all places. In virtue of this, and in virtue of their connection with other dogmas, such as the necessity of baptism for salvation and the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, mean that these doctrines, in other words, those concerning Adam and Eve and original sin, must themselves be considered to be infallible. Article 14. Adam and Eve were endowed with supernatural grace and with other gifts transcending human nature. The Council of Trent. These gifts included the possibility never to suffer nor to die, clarity of intellect and strength of will, the complete control of all the movements of the mind and senses, the passions and the emotions. Article 15. They were seduced by the devil in the form of a serpent to transgress a commandment given them by God to test their obedience. Biblical Commission. Tradition completes this article by teaching that the first couple also sinned by pride. This is based on the words of the seducer quoted in Genesis, you will be like gods knowing good and evil. Both the rebel angels and the first couple sinned by pride then, by adoring themselves and attempting to, inverted commas, become like gods. But as St. Maximus the Confessor says of the, t of the couple, which we can apply also to the rebel angels, to become like gods, yes, but without God, before God, and not in accord with God. This, in the case of the angels, my dear people, was the beginning of that current of thought and action I referred to before, known as gnosis. This is based on one particular principle, and that is that the rational creature can become like God, can become God in a certain sense by his own power. This was the desire of Lucifer. This was the desire, then seduced by Lucifer, of Adam and Eve to become God, to become like God, but against God. This current of thought and action we see to the present day, my dear people, and will continue to the end of time, in those who wish to be like God, to be like gods in their lives, either because they put themselves in the centre of the universe and make themselves God unconsciously, or because they follow that system known as Gnosis, which has appeared in different forms in the course of the centuries. The form in which it appears today particularly is that of the Freemasonry, which is a Gnostic sect proposing to man to become like God, although it will not say so explicitly, at least not in the lower echelons. We see it also in the, the sects such as New Age, Anthroposophy, Theosophy, and so on, 
And these have a long history, dating back to the, the, ty the, the times of the early church, and indeed back to Egypt and Babylonia, and finding their origin, in fact, in the sin of Lucifer himself. Article 15. The, the sin of Adam and Eve is original sin, known as original sin, whereby they fell, losing supernatural grace and other gifts that they had received, the Council of Trent. The fall consisted in the loss of the gifts they had received, a loss which affected a transformation of nature from the elevated nature to the fallen nature. Fallen human nature is human nature without grace, a nature subject to suffering and death, weakness of intellect and will, disordered move, movements of mind and sense, passions and emotions, a disorder known as concupiscence. Fallen nature is subject also to the influence of the devil. This is the inheritance of Adam and Eve. Just as the rebel angels sinned by pride, then fell and were transformed in their nature from angels to devils, so also the first couple. Article 17. They lost grace and other gifts for themselves and for the whole human race, apart from our blessed Lord and his blessed Mother, since they had acted as representatives for the whole human race, Council of Trent. We have seen how our blessed Mother was preserved immune from the taint of original sin, from the loss of grace and from concupiscence, although she was, of course, not immune from all of its consequences, most notably not from that of suffering, since she, in fact, was to suffer more than anyone was ever to suffer apart from her Divine Son. Her Divine Son was, of course, also immune from the taint of original sin, since he is a divine person in, in whom nothing imperfect can dwell, nor can anything imperfect attach to his human nature in virtue of its intimate union to his divinity, the hypostatic union. Two questions to conclude. First, can the church accept the so-called Big Bang Theory? not as an explanation of the existence of the universe that excludes the creative action of God. Question two. Can the church accept the theory of evolution, that man descends from the apes or from a common ancestor of both? No, not as a complete explanation of human nature, since man consists in part of a soul which, being spiritual, cannot derive from matter, humani generis, Pius XII. Something which is higher cannot derive from something that is lower. A spiritual soul cannot derive from an animal. However long an animal might exist on this earth, he will never generate a spiritual soul any more than a computer or a washing machine, my dear people, giving rather a banal example, because the higher cannot derive from the lower. This, according to our scholastic philosophy, which is also the philosophy of common sense. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to
to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As in the beginning, time shall be. Lord, without end, Amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy. Hail, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this veil of tears. Turn then, O most gracious Advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O most holy Mother of God. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 